When most people think of prawns and crabs, they think of garlic butter dip and a gluttonous feast. However, in addition to filling our bellies, these critters also uphold a critical role in coastal ecosystems. Ever since I set my first prawn trap, I always wondered what it would be like to be able to witness the fascinating creatures that inhabit the deep sea in their natural element. There are three deep-dwelling crustaceans that I have obsessed over since the very first time I encountered them. The Pacific Spot Prawn, the Pandalus Borealis Shrimp, and the Brown Box Crab. Combining my knowledge of the sea with modern technologies, I will venture into places no human has ever been before. I will take my submersible and attempt to dive into the deep depths of the Salish Sea to search for these deep water crustaceans. My hope and goal is to observe them interacting in and with their natural habitat. There is a world down there that most people don't even really know exists. It is a massive expanse, far greater in size than even the largest mountains, forests, or deserts. It's a strange place, weird mysterious, and extremely difficult to explore. I've never been able to look at something in the marine environment, momentarily admire it, and then just move on. These places have always demanded much more of my attention than that. My curiosity has pulled me deeper than I thought possible. And I suppose it is in this curiosity that this story really begins. The deep sea is so far beyond our natural ability to explore. And yet, it is a major part of our world the largest part of our world. I am setting out to chase my curiosity deep into my home waters. I will build and drop traps rigged with deep sea lights and cameras. I will drop fishing lines and I will deploy my submersible remote operated vehicle equipped with lights and cameras. These tools will allow us to peer into and interact with some of the deepest, darkest parts of the Strait of Georgia in the Salish Sea, in an effort to explore, study, and document the mysteries of the deep. There really was no way for me to know what I was going to find. I think that part of me had a fear that I wasn't going to find anything at all. Just a dark, muddy infinity. but that simply was not the case.
to explore our deep oceans. It's kind of like wandering around in the dark in a place completely foreign to you, hoping to bump into something interesting. There's no trailhead, no signage. You've got marine charts and sonar. And at some point, you just have to pick a spot and send your cameras down. Once you venture beyond where you would feel comfortable snorkeling or scuba diving, you enter a place so few people have ever seen. And then you start to realize how little we know about these places. These animals are truly bizarre. This place is harsh and foreboding, but it's also beautiful and tremendously important. This is Deep Sea BC. When they hatch, all crustaceans float around in the ocean's currents as microscopic zooplankton, filling the water with life. After a while, they finally settle on the ocean floor and begin to grow. The food that exists in these marine environments is incredible. I must admit that more often than not over the years, as I've explored the ocean, my interest in certain animals usually starts with food. First, I want to catch them, and then I want to see what they taste like. Finally, I want to learn about them and make sure that they will always be here for the environment and the palates of appreciation of our future generations. There is such a diverse abundance of things that you can eat out here, just waiting for the picking. To swim through the water is such a fun way to explore and collect your food. That stuff you can eat. I've always tried to teach my kids to only take the lives of the animals that you are going to eat and to never take too much. I think that the more you do outside, the more opportunities there are for fun and learning. I am lucky to have kids that enjoy playing in the ocean. Sea urchins, rock scallops, sea cucumbers, prawns, shrimp, and a variety of crabs the list goes on. For sea cucumbers and sea urchins, for a delicious wild seafood feast tonight. A sea cucumber! A sea cucumber! <laughs> that is a sea cucumber. It's big! The kids tend to get really excited every time we catch or observe an octopus. I mean, they have blue blood and can change color. What's not to get excited about? They are super intelligent. We have even seen them unscrew the lids to our bait cups and our prawn traps. And watching them ink as they jet away is always fun. When you are fishing or trapping or hand harvesting animals in these marine environments, you are fulfilling a role in the food chain as a predator. There are too many things in our oceans that have been overfished and are now threatened or endangered, like the abalone, for instance. They are supposedly delicious, but due to overfishing, it has been illegal to harvest these animals in BC for as long as I have been alive. They are still beautiful to observe, clinging to the rocks in high current areas and have brilliant shells. Sharing these experiences with my children has really enhanced the experience for me, and I have no doubt that they will be better stewards of these places than the generations before them. I grew up running along the shores of the Sunshine Coast in British Columbia, 
flipping rocks, catching shore crabs, and gazing with wonder into the glimmer of the ocean's surface. This place is surrounded by ocean, sweet salty air, and the chaotic frenzied cry of excited seagulls are staple characteristics that help to connect people to place in the communities that spread out along these shorelines. This area is the home of Seashell Nation. The Seashell people have been connecting to this place since time immemorial, as is evident through their culture, language, and traditions. When you connect to a place long enough, the influence of the land, animals, mountains, and the sea on your being is inevitable. I am gearing up to spend the day boating and exploring the shoreline with Wesley Jeffries from Seashell Nation. Wes holds a deep connection with the land, the sea, and the animals that walk, fly, and swim through this place. My teachings were from my mother. My mother uh, was born on Guilford Island up north, and she became Alert Bay band member. My father's from here in Seashelt, uh, born up uh, uh, Jervis Inlet in Hunachin. My mother had taught me a lot about my beliefs and my values and the traditions and the culture and the rituals. And, and you can't talk about one thing without talking about the other. The big word we shared earlier is the, it's connection. We travel the ocean, our people used to go by canoe, travel to all sorts of nations, talk about potlatches, invite people to potlatches. A lot of the food comes from the ocean and that makes the people happy, you know, they, they, the guests are fed and they, they don't go hungry. And that's the connection to them too. Nature was our grocery store. And preserving it, we would smoke it. So seasons meant a lot to our people. Like the summer and all, it's spring and all that was preparing for winter. The deep sea, it's unfamiliar because we, we a lot of us can't go down there. It's, it's, a, it's a mystery to us. It's dark down there, but yet there's light. And how do you think that is? because there's life down there. There's all kind of life that we don't know about. Life that carries on without us. They don't need us. We need them. You gotta change it around that. We need that resource to keep us alive. A lot of it's part of our diet, like the cod, the ling cod, the halibut, octopus, the squid, prawns, everything down there that's that's got, you know, life that we consume to keep ourselves alive. Traditionally, our people ate that while well, it, it was the only uh, food source that they had, but they lived off the, the ocean. And again, it was, that, that was a mystery to them too as well because they couldn't get down there like the technology can today. We have to be responsible for the resources in the world. Like the ocean, we're polluting the ocean right now and it's killing the species and that's our food source. It keeps us alive. We cannot survive without the connection. That's, that should be on a, the top of our list, is taking a look at connecting with everything. Everything on our planet is connected. Recognizing this is crucial to understanding the natural balance of our beautiful ecosystems. I still get excited every time I go to pull up a crab or prawn trap. Setting traps can be a lot of work. There is a lot of baiting and dropping and setting and moving. It can be physically demanding pulling up traps by hand, but you can take comfort in the fact that you are earning your meal at the end of the rope. So one of the things I absolutely love about fishing and trapping is that other, in addition to, you know, putting some food on the table, some delicious seafood, you never know what you're going to pull up from the deep, mysterious depths of the ocean. Uh, like these crabs, for example, super hairy, like covered in these 
bristly, coarse hairs. Funny looking little guys. I'm sure you're saying the same thing about me. But one thing that's absolutely fascinating about crabs and crustaceans in general is that several times during their lifespan, they actually shed their exoskeleton. So they, they crawl out of the back of their shell and they leave everything behind, including their lungs, and they start a new, larger uh, version of themselves. Imagine crawling out of your body and leaving everything, your skin and your lungs behind, and then just growing bigger and starting anew. That must require a tremendous amount of energy. During that time, when they're molting, um, they are extremely vulnerable to predation. So most of them hide under the mud. They'll bury themselves until their exoskeleton grows and hardens once again. I've never seen this crab in person before. Twins. Ow. We're going to let them go back to the depths from where they came. One thing most people don't know is that tr prawns are true hermaphrodite, meaning that they're all born males. And then after about two to three years, they turn into females. This guy's too small, so away he goes. Mmm, yummy. A sea snail. I tried eating these once. I boiled a bunch of them. They're, they're not very good. Sure took a while, but he's really coming out of his shell now, aren't you? Go home! Crawl on out of here! Because the prawns and shrimp we catch in our traps live in a place too deep for me to visit with masks and snorkels, or even scuba tanks, I have always wondered what they do down there, and how they interact with their natural ecosystem. But never in my life did I ever imagine having the knowledge, tools, and technologies to venture into their domain for the rare and unique opportunity to observe and learn about them firsthand. During my journey, I have quickly learned that exploring the deep sea is not as easy as dropping an ROV to the bottom and immediately finding some interesting life forms to film. Tides, currents, weather, and other factors need to be taken into account. I've spent an incredible amount of time studying marine charts and looking for specific geographic features that may be likely spots for hosting life. I arrive at a spot where I have marked a shelf on my marine charts. This spot is known to be a productive prawn spot. If I deploy my submersible in a strong ebbing or flooding tide, the current will take out too much tether before it reaches the seafloor. Using the ROV in too much current introduces extra risks and makes it much harder to stay with interesting features or animals long enough to film properly. So I wait for slack tide. The window for exploring is narrow. I check the lights, cameras, and propulsion. Finally, I deploy the submersible my tool for connecting to these deep-dwelling crustaceans. If you dive down to the bottom of the food chain in these coastal ecosystems, you will find microscopic phytoplankton and zooplankton. These are plants and animals floating around in the ocean's currents, and they provide the foundation for the food chain pyramid. Not too far from plankton are the crustaceans known as krill. Krill eat phytoplankton and zooplankton, and help to make up the bottom of the food chain pyramid in these coastal ecosystems. They provide food for baleen whales, sharks, salmon, cod, and almost all other fish species, especially in their juvenile state. Marine snow are organic particles that rain down from above in the water column. These particles are important food sources for the crustaceans of the deep. The anticipation builds as our ROV descends. We touch down in 450 feet of water. Our hard work is rewarded. I follow a muddy bottom 
that looks like what I would imagine the surface of the moon to be like. I come across a large log that looks like an old piling, or maybe the mast of an old tall ship. Underneath the log is a cluster of prawns. Spot prawns are the largest of the seven commercial species of shrimp in British Columbian waters. They have been recorded at lengths of up to 12 inches, and the maximum age ever recorded is 11 years. They have been known to feed on worms, diatoms, dead organic material, algae, small mollusks, sponges, and other shrimp. Natural predators of the spot prawn include such fish as halibut, Pacific cod, flounders, yellow-eye rockfish, and octopus. After exploring the prawns, I send the ROV into deeper water in search of the Pandalus borealis shrimp. It doesn't take long, and they start to appear, scattered across the seafloor. Shrimp inhabit a range of water depths from 20 to 1400 meters, or 66 to 4620 feet. They are smaller than spot prawns, but have a very similar life cycle. The most common shrimp found in BC waters is the Pandalus borealis. These shrimp have been found to have a high diversity of fish DNA in their stomachs, showcasing just how important they are in cleaning up the detritus that falls from higher up in the water column. These critters work hard to consume the detritus that falls to the ocean floor. Without them, the ocean floor would get choked out with muck. They are like little mini cleaners, crawling around, sweeping and feeding, and as a result, cleaning the ocean floor and the water. The battery on the ROV runs low. It is time to retrieve it back from the deep. I set a course for a ledge that descends into a much deeper trench, a place where I have, in the past, caught brown box crab. All kinds of questions run through my head. How deep do I have to go? Are they only here during certain times of the year? Are they still here? Or were they just passing through? I deploy the ROV with high hopes, but my expectations are managed by the vastness of the sea. I engage the auxiliary lights as we approach the seafloor. Again, at first there is just a muddy abyss. And again, I start combing the seafloor for life. And then, suddenly, something on the monitor catches my eye. At first it looks like two algae-covered rocks sitting in the mud. But as I approach with the ROV, I realize that we have managed to find what we were looking for. The brown box crab in its natural habitat. This deep water dwelling crab looks like a transformer crossed with a rock. They have been found as deep as 547 meters or 1800 feet. They get very large, but have avoided a commercial fishery in BC due to their less than marketable appearance. However, they are delicious. They are a type of king crab, like the famous Alaska king crab. They live in big aggregations and move together and molt together at similar times within this aggregation. The box crab's front claws have a circular opening, believed to aid in respiration when the crab is buried in the sediment. Little is known about the feeding habits of box crabs. It is postulated that the box crab, like other crab, probably feed mainly on invertebrates, bivalves, and organic debris. We were lucky enough to observe one of the brown box crabs feeding on a piece of what looked like cold water coral. It was hard to tell if he was eating it or cleaning it by eating what was on it. It is more likely that he was cleaning it. The major predator of the box crab is thought to be the Pacific giant octopus. The larger males scuttle across the ocean floor in the springtime, looking to mate with the smaller females. We were able to observe several males attempting to crawl on top of these females, but all efforts were thwarted by the quicker moving, more agile females. They have a very dull brown appearance and seem to have all kinds of algae and growths. 
on the tops of their shells. Some of the other crustaceans that they share this deep sea habitat with, such as the shrimp, seem to be taking advantage of some of this growth. We observed one shrimp in particular hitching a ride on a larger brown box crab's shell or back, a crabby back ride. And then, in and amongst the segregation of brown box crab was a stubby squid. These squid inhabit depths of up to 1,500 meters or 5,000 feet. It was fascinating. If a fish or something that could potentially be a predator came near, it would shoot out of the way and change color to match cover like a piece of seaweed that was nearby. Its ability to change color like that so quickly was just phenomenal to observe. The defense mechanism of a brown box crab is to tuck all of its appendages in, kind of like a sea turtle. As it does this, it takes on the appearance of a muddy, hairy rock. As a predator, I would say most species would have a very difficult time consuming it in this state, as they have a very hard, thick, spiky shell, much tougher than most other crabs. A feeling of satisfaction sweeps over me, as a childhood dream that was once written off as impossible is now realized. But this feeling is quickly replaced by an eagerness to explore more. The deep sea is a treacherous place to call home. The animals that live down here have adapted and evolved over millions of years. And to get to see them down there, interacting as part of their natural ecosystem, is an incredible experience that not many people get a chance to observe. Activities that pull you into the environment, such as fishing, trapping, snorkeling, diving, swimming, and so on. All of these interactions allow us to appreciate these places more. And once we develop this appreciation, we can begin to embark on a lifelong journey of learning, caring, and protecting. But the appreciation needs to come first. The natural world is full of wonder, mystery, and lessons. Our deep sea is full of wonder, mystery, and lessons. We as a species just need to figure out a way to observe, appreciate, and protect these places and the animals that call them home.